Please welcome our panellists, Chief Executive Officer of Future Fund, Raphael Arndt, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, John Graham. Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of Tomasic Holdings and Tomasic International, Dylan Pillay, Sandra Sagara. Chief Executive Officer of FCLT Global, Sarah Williamson. And our Moderator, Vice Chair and Senior Advisor of the Eurasia Group, Gerald Butts. So folks, I think our last speaker set the stage pretty well. We, ha we need a lot of money and we don't have very much time. <laughs> so it's uh, great that Sarah and I, you, get, you and I get to share the stage with about a trillion dollars. Good. Um, I thought it would be good as someone who's, uh, there's nobody better to set the stage for us, Sarah. Perhaps you could talk about where you see ESG investing, um, but more importantly from a broad perspective. Where are we? Are we any closer to a solution now than we were 10 years ago? Well, I think we're getting there, but I think that what we all have to recognize is, as investors, is that it used to be that the investor's goal was really to hit a financial target, be the benchmark, outperform your peers, be able to pay your liabilities, whatever it was. But over time, what's happened is that the objectives have broadened, and it's no longer good enough just to hit those financial metrics. Those are still very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Doing any of those things is, is difficult in and of itself. Um, but the, the objectives have broadened. And so when we think about something like climate, then investors are, are, are in a put in a position of how do, how do they deal with that. And they need to make real choices, and they need to be clear about their choices. So what we see in this world is there's a lot of confusion. And part of that is because people use the same words for different things. Um, people have tried to obfuscate things and sort of mix them all together. So the way that we think about breaking this piece puzzle apart a little bit particularly when it comes to climate, is if you think about a portfolio, what can you do? You could be silent in a portfolio, just not say anything about climate, and that may make sense, you know, cash or something else. You can be principled. I'm not going to buy something because I think it's wrong. People have done that forever. People, you know, tobacco or landmines or whatever it may be. Just, um, or I'm going to invest in something that's not economic because I think it's right. You can also be analytic, which is what we think is just plain good investing. The world is changing, so not thinking about ESG or climate change is, would, would not be prudent. I mean, if you're, if you're going to invest in um, a, a real estate development, you probably want to know if you're in a floodplain, right? It's pretty basic. It's just plain old good investing. And then the last is to be catalytic. And I think to your point on the, the amount of money on the stage, that's what big investors can do. They can frankly throw their weight around a little bit. They can engage with companies. <laughs> they can create new markets. And they can really sort of smooth the path for others. So I think we are making progress. I think that a few years ago, this was a sideline conversation. Now it's not. Um, but, but we're not there yet. Great. Dylan, we're in your home turf here. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the progress that's being made toward these catalytic investments, as Sarah put it? Well, what we've seen over the years is that more and more private capital is going towards the solutions that we need to have uh, to contribute towards a net zero world. Um, we've seen more capital going to um, you know, very early stage tech-based solutions, uh, and that will help over time with more, if we can catalyze more capital, we will come to a stage where the carbon abatement cost curve will come down when we can start to commercialize this and put it into the market and mainstream them. I think we're also finding that the, uh, that the traditional players are willing to be partners with these early stage companies. Uh, we also see more infrastructure spend going in to build the infrastructure needed for energy transition, for example. And we see more and more um, the fact that not just countries are committing net zero, but companies are mm -hmm. committing net zero. And they're doing things about that. They're setting metrics for themselves. I mean, we ourselves have a metric that in 2030, the carbon emissions that are attributable to our share of companies uh, in our portfolio will be half of what it was in 2010. It's not easy for us because we actually own an airline. Um, but, uh, you know, we're all committed to doing that because if we don't, then we're not going to get to where we need to get to. So for some of us who have a portfolio of companies which are in hard to base sectors, the, the, the issue is multifold, right? Number one is that we've got to encourage the companies to be on a journey. 
to decarbonize. And that means what they can do to ensure a just transition. And it's not just about transi transitioning in terms of the technology or going into a, a lower carbon emitting business or where your carbon intensity is lower. It's also about the workforce. How do you then you know, take care of the transition of the workforce, which comes to the F part to some extent. Uh, but, for, uh, so the, but for us as a, as a shareholder, as an as investor, how do we invest in things which are useful for those companies? So for example, in the in context of the airline, while the airline is doing its bit to invest in new aircraft which are 25 to 30% more fuel efficient than uh, the, the fleet it's replacing, we need to think about investing in sustainable aviation fuels because that is going to be a driver for them to be able to comply with Corsia requirements. That's just an example. So there is a role for governments to set a framework for which we can all operate under. In the US with the IRA, that's a good example of something like that. Uh, you need to think about carbon pricing as well in that context. You need the companies to decide what it means for them to be responsible in the context of transition and the journey they want to take. You need investors to bring capital to bear so that we can contribute towards not just infrastructure, but the solutions which are out there. So I think it requires all of us to come together to do something about it. And I think that we've seen more movement uh, in the last few years than I would have expected. That's the, and at the end of the day, of course, it takes a business case, John. So tell us a little bit about how you think about the core business case for ESG investing at CPPIB. Yeah, and, uh, and maybe I'll build a little bit on what uh, Dylan mentioned and talk about the kind of the evolution we've gone through at CPP Investments. And uh, you know, a couple years ago, we thought, and I'll focus mainly on sustainability, mainly on climate. A couple years ago, we really viewed it through a risk lens mm -hmm. and really thought about transition risk, physical risk, how we do security selection, incorporating physical risk, transition risk, how we think about the resilience of the broader portfolio. But slowly, we kind of evolved our mindset into thinking that this is actually a generational investment opportunity. And we're actually really excited about it. And it's one of the areas that we've been really building out internally, building out capabilities that the world will do what it can to transition to a low carbon future. And I see numbers of 50, 70, I think I saw 120 trillion actually yesterday. I don't know what the number is, but it's a really big number yeah. of capital that be, will be required. And it's not just a transition from fossil fuels to renewable. It's the entire economy that needs to transition. It's aviation. It's, it's steel, cement. The entire economy needs to, to transition. And that, for long-term patient capital, presents an incredible uh, investment opportunity. So you know, we have a mandate of maximizing return without undue risk, undue risk of loss. But we viewed that you know, this is something we want to be an active participant in. We made a net zero commitment uh, earlier this year. We've been building out a team dedicated to investing in the transition. And again, not just investing on the energy side, but actually working with companies and trying to invest in you know, heavy emitting sectors and work with them to become more green and hopefully make money um, selling the green dollars on the, on the back end. So for us, as we think about, again, that um, investment opportunity, this is where we can see the next 10 years providing some of the, the best investment opportunities. And you see that across the economy, not just in the energy sector? Yeah, we see it across the, you know, the, our, the entire economy, right? It's an entire economy transition. We've been creating a framework to apply to all our portfolio companies and looking at the carbon within the company and at what cost of carbon can we remove right. the, the carbon. And the first asset we did it on was actually a retail asset. It was a shopping mall in the UK. And not what you'd think of immediately, but a shopping mall in the UK and coming to the view that we could remove the majority of the carbon with really marginal investment in CapEx. Mm -hmm. Some of it will be very difficult to remove, but instead of waiting, let's just start now and remove the, the carbon we can. That's very interesting. Raphael, you're from a country that has seen, call it a stop and go approach to climate policy over the past 20 years to be diplomatic. And our house view at Eurasia Group is that the energy transition, while it's happening, will be a lot more disruptive and bumpier than people expect it to be. Can you reflect on that from your perspective as an Australian investor? Yeah, sure. I mean, the world's never been in a position before where we sort of collectively decided to retire uh, an enormous industry of capital stock that's still effective, at least from an economic point of view. And uh, to your earlier point about 
how much the world has changed. You know, there's no argument anymore as mm -hmm. I move around financial circles about whether we're doing this. Um, we've just had a whole series of multilateral meetings right across the world. Everyone agrees we're doing it and we need to do it. The question is how and how do you make it fair and affordable for people? And so I think um, whether it's Australia or anywhere else, you know, there's the politics and ultimately the politicians all across the world have to set the policy and the policy will either help or impede private capital to come and solve the, the issues. Mm -hmm. But actually the private markets have been getting on with it anyway and there's been an enormous amount of investment in um, renewables and other types of technology and research. Australia's I think got the highest take up of rooftop solar in the world, for that's example. Right. Uh, that's actually causing issues with the power grid because in the middle of the day when it's sunny, actually there's not much demand, which is a great problem to have, but you need to bring capital to solve that. So I think, I think for people like us, we're, you know, all of us I think now in the world are really fortunate that there are big pension funds, sovereign funds who, who are organising capital and who are thinking long term. And so Sarah's job is to bring those people together and talk to the companies to make sure they're focused on the right thing in the long term. And in the long term, there's no debate, there's no tension between the right thing and the good investment. Because ultimately, if it's going to be a sustainable investment that will pay off, it has to be both. Yeah, and there are two things coming, there's a lot coming up in this conversation, and thank you. But there are two things in particular that strike me as someone who's worked on this issue for a long time and have many of the scars to prove it, <laughs> which my fellow Canadian knows all about. Um, one is just how uniform we all are on the macro picture, right? Mm -hmm. That the direction of travel is set, we can debate the velocity, whether it's sufficient, et cetera, um, but it's pretty clear it's set. And 20 years ago, that would not have been the case had people in your position been having this discussion. The second though, and I think it's really important to, to recognize is just as you put it, uh, Raphael, the magnitude of the task. We really are trying to accomplish something that's never been done before. So I wonder if you could each talk a little bit about the obstacles, um, as frankly as you feel comfortable uh, speaking of them, between you and your part of that task and maybe I'll go in reverse order, sure. Raphael, so. Well, you can you. see it happening in Europe right now. You know, yeah. if, if you move too quickly, people still There's need There's something it. happening in Europe right now? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, affordability is a big issue. And I think there's plenty of parts of the world that don't, still don't have cheap and reliable power. And that's an issue for social outcomes as well. And so being planful is really important. Mm -hmm. And recognising that we're a fossil fuel economy still in the world and we need to transition in a sensible and equitable way will help. And so I think as the world, unfortunately in the last few years, the world politically has got more partisan, more populist, and it's in, impeding those um, conversations. So I think the best thing that can happen, and, and it is happening I think, is um, a consensus understanding and then we can use the technology and the sensible people who know what to do. I'll just make one other comment. I don't think there's a shortage of capital in the world for these sort of investments. There, there is no shortage of capital, there's plenty of capital. The issue is having the framework set up so it's clear and transparent and that capital will come. Mm -hmm. John? Um, I think an area where there continues to need to be improvement is in metrics. In metrics. In metrics and in measurement and, and accounting standards. Um, as mentioned, we've made a, a 2050 net zero commitment. Um, and our portfolio, that's for our portfolio. And we, in our portfolio right now, we only actually have data for about 30% of the portfolio. Mm. So we actually have data from companies about 30% of the portfolio, the rest of the portfolio, we proxy, we estimate, we take industry averages. And undoubtedly, as the metrics improve and they get refined, the numbers move around. Right. And so there's volatility in the numbers. And I always ask our team, is this, is this movement real or is it just volatility? And sometimes you get a shoulder shrug and said, well, we, we had some restatements, we had some companies change the numbers. Um, so as a global investor, and as we think about a global transition, having the ability to have, you know, consistently compare uh, companies, assets across the world, that'll be a huge help to the investment community. Right. And Dylan, one of the things that I've been uh, thinking about um, 
on this topic as far as Tomasic is concerned is no matter what, uh, how successful we are, we're still going to be dealing with um, a climate that's quite different than the one that we've grown up with and done a, lived our lives in. And you as an asset owner, you're, you're there the morning after. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about that problem? Because I think it's a difficult one to say the least. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Right? If, you're, if you're a manager of assets, you can decide to get in and out of a position right. if you choose to do so based on your portfolio construction and the returns environment that you're in. Uh, if you own assets for the long term, then and especially if they're assets that you control, then you really have the morning after. It's not just left to the boards and management teams. So it's a question of how we decide to set our goals and targets and then how we have that brought to our portfolio companies and make sure they are on a, their own journey because we can't run these companies for them. They have to run these companies themselves. But they have to understand that if they're there to deliver long-term sustainable returns to us, for us to deliver long-term sustainable returns to our stakeholders, then they have to be on that journey. And it's a question of making sure that everyone's under the tent. Now, I'm quite f we're quite fortunate at Tomasic that um, we have a very heavily concentrated portfolio. So in a sense, uh, unlike CPPIB, we have, I think, a better uh, visibility into where we are in terms of our carbon emissions today across the portfolio and therefore the metrics that we need to, uh, to, to hit. But we do have companies in the hard to bait sectors, so the built environment, aviation, power generation. We have a, a port operator with 52 ports around the world. So all of these things require you to have solutions, not just for today, but for tomorrow, which means they have to run their business today to do well in order to generate the capital, in order to do what's right, and therefore, at the end of the day, also do what's good. Now, that's not easy to do, but it's a journey, and they have to figure out how they're going to be able to execute that plan according to the business they're in and the external dynamics as well, because most of our companies can't do things without the rest of the ecosystem doing it as well. You know, so you can only catalyze action if you can show what's the benefit that you're bringing to your ecosystem partners. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can boot do all you can if the other side doesn't come to the, uh, to the table. You're not going to have the outcomes that you want to get, and you're not going to have the outcomes for which you put your capital at risk for. Right. And so that's something that we look at very carefully when we look at our companies. I, wa I want to do a bit of um, an optimism check here. <laughs> uh, we've got a poll. This is the privileged panel to have the only poll of the day, I'm oh. told, Sarah. And I'm, I'm going to do that optimism check with you in a second. But let's check in with our audience. Um, if you could answer the following question um, or descri description of ESG factors. In your opinion, are ESG factors A, an essential tool in responsible investing? B, promising but unproven. C, <laughs> just an excuse for money managers to charge you fees. Or D, partly to blame for the global energy crisis. We won't show the answer for a little while, so you have time to do it. But how do you feel about how the conversation's going, Sarah? Are we too optimistic here? No, I don't think we're too <laughs> optimistic. But I do think one of the things we have to keep in mind is the link between um, paper portfolios, commitments on paper, and real-world decarbonization. And I think this conversation is already reflected on that. You're talking about, you know, airline fuel, and you're talking about portfolios. And what I'm hearing a lot of in the world of investing is I want to clean up my portfolio. Actually, oftentimes, the easiest way to clean up my portfolio is to sell something dirty to somebody else. Now, that does absolutely nothing for the planet, our future, our children, our grandchildren. So to me, the question is, how do we r recognize that in order to clean up assets, we have to own them, mm -hmm. and therefore we need to be able to own them. That may go against a net zero commitment in, a, in the, the short term. Um, but the solution is not essentially to take the, the garbage out of your own house and throw it in your neighbor's yard. That does not work here. And so I think that that is something that we've really got to keep in mind. I, I think that's such a great point that um, someone once said to me that everybody takes theology textbooks to climate change as a problem, but it's really math class at the end of the day. Uh, there are several trillion tons of carbon in the atmosphere that shouldn't be there, and we're adding to it every year under all of the scenarios that we've been describing. So how do you think about that particular problem? And I'm not going to call on any one of you in particular, but raise a hand. Well, that's what I was referring to yeah. before, yeah. you know, and uh, again, to make a point, so I agree with John, like we need metrics so we can know what we're investing in. And most, imp I think 
Um, most developed economies are headed there quickly. Most regulators are already working on that. Emerging markets are struggling to keep up, and so that ultimately will become an impediment for capital for those parts of the world. And they, they're the ones that need the capital most to build new sustainable um, infrastructure. Um, so I am optimistic, um, but I think, as I was saying before, we need to take the heat out of the politics so we can focus on the solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we've we been quite clear that um, we don't believe divestment is, a, mm -hmm. yeah. is, is the right path forward. And we know how to have a net zero portfolio because we know what we'd have to sell. Yeah. But to Sarah's point, we would just sell it to someone else. To whom, yeah. It, it, it would have no impact. And so it's what I was referring to earlier of taking an approach, and, and many others are doing it, is try to build out a real competency, a real capability of being an active, long-term, patient, engaged investor uh, and working with companies on the transition and supporting them through the transition. It's a difficult thing to do, though, right? These companies um, don't normally look to their financiers for operational advice in that way. How do you approach that problem set from the perspective of a fund manager? Well, I think Dylan touched on a little bit. I think what's important as an investor, we're, we don't operate the companies, right? We, we're there as an investor and we, we share our expectations and, and then use our governance rights, whether that be as a board member right. or as a public shareholder to vote. And look, I think there's, you're always looking for that company that's made a net zero commitment and is maybe doing some quiet quitting. Right. <laughs> and really not kind of following through. And uh, then, then you have to use what governance tools you have yeah. to either um, seek change or we will sell at that point if we just don't think that it's being taken seriously. Right, controversial step to take. Uh, has excited some popular press reaction using your governance mm -hmm. powers to make this kind of change happen. Dylan, how do mm -hmm. you think about that? You know, I think you can't force change because it has to come from within because I think yeah. you have to make sure you pull everyone along with you to make it really sustainable in the long term. Because if you're thinking about it, it's not just what you're going to do in the next 10 years. It's going to be the impact of the business model beyond that. And, you know, it's, it's even beyond 2050, if you think about it from that perspective. You want to have companies that are resilient. I mean, you know, I said earlier, we have to build resilient portfolios. Therefore, your company's got to be resilient. It's got to be resilient across cycles. And therefore, it's got to know what it takes to be resilient. So if there are a few things that are facing companies today, right? Quite apart from the external environment, and you're talking about inflation, you're talking about uh, things to do with uh, geopolitics and decoupling and all that kind of stuff. But fundamentally, we look at your business model. The big issue is transformation of your business model. Whether it's to transform it from a carbon emitting business into a less carbon emitting business, into a green business, that's one element. The second element, of course, is that technology is a driver of change going forward. And you, have to, you, you can't look at a climate change mitigation adaptation transition strategy without looking at technology. Mm -hmm. But technology has its impact in different ways. The externalities of using technology is that you might need a smaller workforce. What you then do about your workforce, how do you train them and prepare them for either the transformation that you're going to put into effect or for alternatives outside of your company, your sector, you know, which, which allows them to continue to be productive. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, if you look at the E and the S, the S goes towards also a form of resilience, but that's more about social resilience. Mm -hmm. And we all have a, you know, a responsibility as, as owners of capital um, and how we deploy capital to make sure that while we're solving, we could be solving one problem, we don't create another. And we try to direct the companies in a way where they can think of both. And then what we do as investors, and I'm sure that's what you know, the Future Fund and CPPI we do, is that we wait to help them think through these issues and work with them to find the solutions. I think that's what we have to do as investors. It's just not about putting our capital to work. I think our capital has to be catalytic. Mm -hmm. It has to be financial for innovation, growth, transformation, etc. It has to be about uh, human capital. Do we really invest in human capital? Do we value, celebrate human capital? That's important. And it links to a third part, which is social capital. How do you promote social progress and resilience in societies and communities in which you operate? And finally, it's about natural capital, right? The fact that environment is important to create a clean earth for future generations. But the E and S, therefore, has an interlinkage, and we have to be very clear-minded about how we're going to approach this. I'm actually not a fan of metrics when it comes to the S, I'll be quite frank, you know? I mean, I have this internal discussion with my ESG folks who love metrics because it, they tell me that about well, sustainable bond framework, I've got to put some metrics there because it's bots who are reading, the, you know, reading it and not a human being. 
Well, I said, no, we've got to put a narrative there. If you put, if you put stats, you've got to explain the stats so that people know what you're doing and what you're doing is correct. And they have a right to criticize if they don't think that you're doing it correctly. Um, but I think the S is the most difficult to put a number on because it covers so many different things. And I think intentionality is the most important. The other thing that I may mention is this. We focus a lot about impact for climate, which is important, but we also have to look at impact for communities. Mm -hmm. And they come together. If we don't think about what's going to happen to uplift communities, especially those in emerging markets, which are subject to the vagaries of climate change, I think that's a bigger issue. And that has an adaptation uh, um, you know, sort of problem to solve. Well, and I think you're getting to the core of the issue, which is the relationship between the three letters and the alphabet soup. Mm. Raphael, how do you think about yeah. that? I know you have a... Well, I think at the end of the day, all, all these issues are social. Yeah. You know, or the three of us all represent government investment funds, or if you're a pension fund or a superannuation fund, you've got direct members. And new generations are just thinking about these things in different ways. And so ultimately, if we don't behave in a way that they think is right with their money, then, you know, we won't be allowed to continue to do what we do. So ultimately, doing the right thing on the environmental side or having decent governance or making sure you don't participate in modern slavery or that you're thinking about equity across your staff, all, all of those things are just good business practice. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm pleased to report that the audience is at least as optimistic as we are, <laughs> folks. A clear majority, um, I mean, it's hard to get a clear majority <laughs> for anything these days, uh, chose option A, that it's an essential tool for uh, in responsible uh, investing. And the more deleterious options were not chosen by very many people. So that's a, I think that's a positive sign uh, for the future. We do have a great question from the audience, uh, from a former colleague of mine, wondering, what do the panelists make of the backlash to ESG from some quarters, particularly in some subnational jurisdictions in certain countries? Well, I guess as the American <laughs> on the panel, that means me. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, here, here's the way that I would think about this. The f the, there is in the in many circles, there's an idea that there's a real trade-off. You can be sustainable or you can make money. You can think about your shareholder or you can think about your stakeholder. And that is just not supported by the facts. Because if you think about who the stakeholders are in a company, they're the customers, they're employees. You know, I've never seen a company that has created value over long periods of time that says, I don't, I don't care about my customers, I don't care about my employees. That's not how companies thrive. So, you know, one analogy that I've thought about uh, on this trade-off thing is if you remember in the 1970s, the U.S. car makers thought about quality as a trade-off. Okay, you, you, we could invest more money in the cars, but it costs us more, raise the quality. Okay, we know how that story ended, right? The Japanese car companies and other people ate their lunch. So that is essentially what's going on right now, which is people can say, there's a trade-off, I'm not going to deal with that, but then they're not building for the future. Mm. So there is pushback in the US. I think a lot of it is semantics. Some of it is a, is a confusion between, or an obfuscation between what are ESG factors, which in my mind are just as just good investing, investing for the future, thinking about governance, thinking about all the things we've been talking about, versus ESG outcomes. And are you, as a fiduciary, using somebody else's money to further your political goals? That's wrong. And people right. should push back on that. Um, or are investors and business people doing the politician's job, which is deciding what social or economic policy should be? That's also wrong and annoys the politicians because that's their job. So I think that the ESG factor side, using ESG um, factors to think about how to invest is really uncontroversial for anybody who thinks about it deeply. The question is more on the other side, which is the outcome side. I think the for anybody who thinks about it deeply might be the operative phrase there, <laughs> Sarah. Um, how do you guys think about this? Is this an issue, that, is this a real issue that you think about when making final investment decisions, or do you see it as something that's part of the growing pains of ESG <laughs> and it will fade away as time goes on? Yeah, you, you actually touched on a little bit earlier in time with the, and you certainly see sometimes a difference in approaches between an asset owner and asset manager, and thinking about how right. to ha having to live with a decision uh, longer term as, a, as, as an asset owner. And I've been talking mainly on the E side, and we've focused a lot on the E side, but I totally agree that if 
it's like pushing air around a balloon, right? It, it, it's a very nuanced dis discussion, and if you hit too hard on the E, undoubtedly it causes a problem in, in, in other parts of the, of the ESG. Um, I, I think internally at CPP Investments, we don't even like to use the term ESG anymore because it's three kind of distinct areas that require its own discussion and factors and, and thinking about it. Um, it is good investing, considering these on our all our investments, considered on the portfolio construction. But even the term ESG, I think it just simplifies it too much. And we've actually just moved away from, from using the term ESG. General agreement yeah. from you guys on this? Uh, I think... Um, you know, the proponents of, I'll say, factoring in long-term externalities over these have done a tremendous job, and that's why we're sitting here optimistic. Right. Yeah. Um, but there are consequences. Mm -hmm. So if you shut down a coal mine or shut down a whole series of power stations, people lose their jobs yeah. and communities lose their lifeblood. And so it's also incumbent on policymakers to think about those things, and, and they've got just as much right to a fruitful, productive life as anyone else, and that's... Mm -hmm. The, the long-term social sustainability. So I think what we're seeing in parts of the US is just a natural response to a one-sided conversation that's going on. And I think as the providers of capital, our job is to look right across the whole ecosystem and say, well, how do we have a managed transition, managed being the operative word. Mm -hmm. And Dylan, do you see this as an extraordinary imposition of um, you know, extraneous constraints on you as an investor? I don't think so at all. Um, I think each investor has to think about what its mandate is, uh, is and what it's supposed to deliver. Now, if our mandate, pension funds, Tomasic as, a, uh, as an owner of assets, but for the benefit of the Singapore government, uh, uh, for all of us, our mandate is to deliver long-term sustainable returns. So you have to figure out what comes within that uh, bucket to deliver long-term sustainable returns. I don't think you can deliver long-term sustainable returns without thinking about ESG. I don't think you can, uh, especially when you're affiliated with the government. Because at some point in time, the political space will come in if you're not thinking more broadly about where you have to go to try to manage uh, the outcomes that you think are going to deliver the returns, but also other externalities have to be managed along with it. So I, I, I think that for us, the, it, it's very important to have, be very clear about our mandate and how we go about making sure we deliver the long-term sustainable returns. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, if you own your own assets, you can put aside part of the capital to look at solutions that could actually be good in the long term to, to catalyze new business models that can create value broadly. And you want to make money from it. I mean, every time we put a dollar to work, we intend to get a return from it over and above our cost of capital. We're not there for concession capital. That's not our mandate. But the, 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 the gestation that, that it takes to deliver to you the result that you're looking for in terms of returns is the critical issue. Now, if you have a three or five year or seven year time frame, it's very difficult to do the things that we have been thinking about uh, in terms of investing in, in properly in ESG, if I still use the three words, or, <laughs> or for that matter, in energy transition. It's very difficult to do that. Because your time frame to retool a business model to deliver the just, just transition doesn't equate with, uh, with what has to be done. But if you don't have that duration limitation and can go beyond it, then you can think more expansively and figure out how to allocate your capital properly between long-term uh, uh, long strategic objectives or strategies and shorter term. By the way, I think the short term is important because there's a discipline in deploying capital short term, but you also want the returns to help fund the long-term uh, orientation you have for your, for your portfolio. So I think it's really dependent upon the mandate that you have. Well, this is a much more optimistic discussion than I expected, Sarah. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if you could reflect on one of the barriers that comes up over and over again is the great pro proliferation of rules mm -hmm. uh, to the point where in early days, early uh, movers in the space have felt the need to internally set their own carbon price, for instance. Uh, do you see that as a risk that these guys who are investing all over the world are going to have to deal with different sets of rules for what constitutes a net zero friendly or ESG investment? The short answer is yes. There are different rules in different countries, and I think there is some convergence. Uh, the ISSB, I think, is doing a terrific job in pulling together ideas, pulling together metrics, um, but the chance that there is global convergence on the same metrics um, is, is fairly low. 
what I uh, have been involved in many of these conversations, what I keep telling people is, if we c it, think of it as you're going to a restaurant, okay, and you've got a long menu, and some countries might choose fewer items off of the menu than other countries. Some may choose more. Some are hungrier, right? They want they want everything on the menu. But can we just make sure it's all either you know Chinese food or all French food or something like that? Because if it's all different and all the math is done differently, then the the, the kitchen is a nightmare. Yeah. And that's what's happening to companies and to investors is that they're they're trying to to, to serve meals from every different kind of culture, and that's not going to work for a long time. And so that is, um, I, I'm I'm hopeful that we will get to a, a smaller number. I don't think we'll get to one. Do you guys feel like this problem is sorting itself out as well? No, hey, not at all. Yeah. There's a lot of work. <laughs> I to found do. it. I found <laughs> it. There's a lot of work to do. But but the good thing is the work is being done. The ISSB yeah. is doing a great job. We're contributing to it, as um, most people in the industry. So we're on the journey. Right. I think that first of all, we don't have all the answers. I mean, we definitely don't. And we we believe that therefore, uh, for us, it's a network of partnerships with like-minded investors who think the same way but also with others who, who have capabilities that will augment the capabilities we have. And, and we have to go out there because this is a nascent uh, you know, um, area to go into. So for example, on metrics, you know, um, proxies that we use, we have to rethink about whether they're still moving in the right direction and so on, and we have to rejig it and retool it and get to different numbers. So we use proxies for 2010 numbers, we also for 2021 uh, 20 numbers, we thought we were 31 million, found out later on we were 33 million. So, you know, it's a journey, right? We don't have all the answers now, but we clearly, uh, as we all learn together, we and others who are in it are going to be able to come up with the right answers for us to, 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 to rely on to, to get to where we have to be. But I want to say one thing. I think we need to have this harmonization. We need to have a taxonomy that works for us all around. It takes some time. In the meantime, we're all going to have to muddle through this, this yeah. issue. And I think in each country, we have to deal with where we see the biggest issue and see how we can come up to the outcome that we think is the right outcome there. So for example, you know, are people going to be concerned about metrics in, the, in some of the emerging markets? The answer is no. How are they going to get to energy transition when they have to deal with uplifting of, uh, of communities or rural populations? Right. How do you tell someone in, uh, in India or in, or in Vietnam or elsewhere you can't use coal-fired plants? Well, how are you going to get electricity to the villages? especially if you, you, know, if you, if you don't have uh, the alternative coming in at a cost-effective basis without the green premium being paid, f paid by a population that has a per capita income that's one-tenth of that of your own country. How do you do that? Yeah. It's an easy answer, easy question to answer in the last minute of the panel, John. Well, I'm not going to answer that <laughs> question. <laughs> I'd say we're still definitely on the metric side in the proliferation stage, which in, is also fine, and people are, it, are excited and enthusiastic. At some point, we need to transition to consolidation yeah. um, and need to think about consolidating some yeah. of these. But at least there's enthusiasm. At least people are focused on it. Sarah, I'm going to give you the last word. Are yeah. you feeling good about the future? I do feel good about the future. I think we are going in the right direction. I think we are going to have a lot of twists and turns. I think the key thing for us is you know, to remember this is a marathon, not a sprint. And when we get tired, just, you know, keep going. So it's going to take a while, but I think we're going the right direction. Anyway, I don't think anyone wants an investor who's a pe pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> right? Realist optimist is the best outcome. Yeah, and I'm a credit investor, right? So. Oh. <laughs> that is a terrific, right on point, right on time ending. So thank you all for participating in this discussion. I hope yeah. the audience enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.